Hello and welcome to Springboard, your virtual university. My name is Albert Okran. Welcoming you on behalf of Team Springboard, ably led by Comfort. This is your most inspirational show and the point where the greatest minds in the world converge. Your virtual university is brought to you by the Springboard Ratio Foundation and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, the enterprise group UMB Bank, with media support from the multimedia group and the graphic communications group. Today we continue with our series Inside the Engine Room. This is season two of what was last year's favorite series for many of you as we explored the behind the scenes stories of achievers in various fields, including the media, academia, leadership, corporate, ministry, and every other field in between. My guest for today was first celebrated here in the Springboard family at the 2013 Ideas Festival with the Ideas Award and subsequently won several awards, including Best Investigative Journalist for the Year 2017 for West Africa, Best Anti-Corruption Journalist also for West Africa for the Year 2018, West Africa Media Excellence Award, and the overall Best Journalist for West Africa for the Year 2020. He's an author with three amazing books, and I call him the Ambassador for Bungu. Investigative journalist Manasse Azuri Awuni is the editor in chief of the Fourth Estate, and he's here with me today in the engine room. Manasse, good to see you. I'm very honored to be here. An absolute blessing to to bounce off and to explore what this amazing year holds for all of us. Let me start by thanking you for what you do for God and country, and for your continuous commitment to what must be a calling for you. Do you feel that? This is like a calling. I feel exactly so because um, it isn't something I am happy doing. There are people who think this work is about enjoying what you do, but to be sincere, I don't enjoy what I do. I, in a way, find fulfillment when there is change and when there is some level of impact in the lives of individuals and also uh, the nation at large. But sometimes when you consider the cost to your personal comfort, the cost to your security, your life, and every other dangers you'd have to go through in order to do this daily, I feel strongly that there must be something beyond uh, going to work that keeps me going. And I consider it as a calling because I don't think I can do any other thing better than journalism. I was going to come to that. I mean, tied into the idea of a calling is the question that if you didn't do this, what else would you do? Well, growing up, and uh, it's the only other job that appeals to me is being an officer of the Ghana Armed Forces. I really admire soldiers and any time I visit Burma camp or I go for a program and I see them, I admire them so much. So beyond that, uh, no other profession actually appeals to me. But having uh, grown up to be someone who speaks his mind freely, I'm beginning to lose that kind of uh, love I had for the army because the army Growing up, it's a soldier from Pemkwasiasem. But I've come to realize that the military is one of the institutions that you could be told the most in Kwasiasem and they say yes sir, and salute. So that is it. But beyond everything else, uh, which is also very related to what I do now, writing is my biggest dream or passion. And so going forward, um, if there's any other thing I would do, it would be to become a novelist. And that is what I am actually looking forward to. Maybe in future I may do journalism part-time, but do full-time writing. Let's go back to where this all began. I, I, I was telling my wife that in my days when I used to follow, follow reggae, a lot. There was this song uh, that says, check out the real situation. Nations war against nation. And the, and the part I liked was the part that said, where did it all begin? So where did this begin for you, Manasseh Azuri Awuni? 
It began at the Sunday school of uh, Evangelical Presbyterian Church, EP Church Ghana, in Kitekrachi. And in Krachi, there used to be what we called picnic, and all the churches would gather on Easter Monday at a venue and celebrate the Easter together. And we used to have uh, drama competitions and other performances. And so at Sunday school, those of us who were very young were giving some poetry to biblical verses to recite the older ones acted plays. And I remember there was this play, the Sunday school was acting, the title was Nyami Oho. And my elder brother, Alex, who happened to be my very first mentor, was the main character. But there was a character for a chief's linguist, Anochiami. And so those of us who were reciting the poet, poetry or Bible verses, after we finished, we would hang around and watch the elder or older ones rehearse. Then a day to the play, the Ochiami didn't show up. And his role was so important that the Sunday school teacher uh, asked around, so who could stand in for the Ochiami whilst just for the rehearsal? Because he didn't, so I raised my hand and he said, okay, come and do it. I acted so well that the substantive actor was dropped. And the following day, I went and then acted. So I think that picture is still there with uh, my elder brother being the major character and people loved it so much. So since then I started acting for Sunday school. Then when I went to Crouchy Senior High School, I joined the drama club. And there used to be the student drama festival. Volta region, that's how it used to be called. I don't know whether it was in other regions. And in the region, I think uh, Maoli school used to be the best. They had all the tools, equipment, and their plays were top-notch, but we also competed. What we did in the first year was written by somebody who was the Center for National Culture, the director in the Kratcher district, one Mr. Mech. Then the following year, when the competition came, he had been transferred out of the district, and so there was no one to write the play for us. So I told my a drama tutor, one Mr. Eche Louise, that I wanted to write a play. Seriously? Yes, because it often came with a theme. So I wrote a play, and uh, he liked it. It matched with the theme. And do, one, do, you, do you remember the theme? The, I think it had something to do with peace, but the title of the play was Land Litigation. And I remembered my junior high school teacher, who was very good when it came to drama, one Mr. George Achebra. So I went to him and said, look, I have written a play for a drama club, but I want you to come in and direct. It was a dance drama, no worse. So Mr. Achebra agreed and came to direct the play. And when we went to act in the zone, we came out first. I think the Krachi zone, it was called Zone 8. So we emerged winners and the it's included in the teacher training colleges. And at the regional level, the Volta region, we had a, we placed sit in the region. That was my first play. Then every time a competition came, I was now trusted to write the plays and uh, would uh, direct and were winning, including writing for junior high schools and all of that. That's how my writing career started. So if you look at my testimonial from the school, you see playwrights as part of what I was doing. Then I completed and uh, got a job as the caretaker of the Ghana Education Guest House in Kitekrachi. And I was doing everything, cleaning the washrooms, washing sheets, and everything with my hands because there's no laundry um, and everything. But in my spare time, I would write short articles and um, short stories and put them on a notice board and some of the guests would read and admire them. And I remember one guest asking, so who wrote this beautiful story? And I said, well, I was the one. And he said, if you could write such a thing, then what are you doing here? Fortunately for me, the Ghana Education Service PRO in the district, one Mr. Fridolin Empe, 
he saw my writings and uh, mentioned to me one day, casually, that you write well. Why don't you go and do journalism? And I said, I did business, and I don't think uh, journalism is for business students. I thought it was for general art students. And at the time, I had applied to UCC, University of Cape Coast, to do BCom, Bachelor of Commerce. It was one of the most um, competitive courses or programs for the business students. And I didn't get admission, so I was waiting to reapply the following year when this suggestion was made to me. So I felt it was good. And all along, I'd wanted to be a bank manager because the greatest inspiration at the time was the Ghana Commercial Bank branch manager in Ketekrachi. He had a small Opel car and was in Thai, and all of us looked after him. So, was it a white shirt? White shirt, yes. And once in a while in a suit. And you hear bank manager, everybody wanted to be like him. It's interesting to hear how many people form their earliest career aspirations based on how people dress. Looking back now, do you get surprised at that? Well, I am not surprised because sometimes it depends on where you are and your worldview. Karachi, even now, is not that developed, a very a peninsula district. And at the time, I don't think there were up to five people who owned private cars in that district. The houses that looked very grand in those days, that today I see them as extremely ordinary houses when compared to the mansions that have been built in the district today all belong to people we didn't uh, know about. Oh, have you seen that house? That's uh, Beba Kumens, a secretary to cabinet, that's the house. Have you seen that house? That's uh, Adukufo, he's a snake board member and an influential member of the NDC. And those were some of the things we're hearing. But this was somebody we could see. And the way he dressed and carried himself about, uh, I don't even know his name. But he looked like somebody who was somebody. So. Uh, I was inspired, and I don't think uh, at the time I would be wrong to have been inspired by such a person. I was also not exposed to television because we bought our first television set when I was in GIJ. We didn't have electricity, and it was once in a while that we could sneak to somebody's house and then watch TV. So my world view was informed by the things I saw. Which was? Yes, and so he was So you applied for BCom and didn't get it, and, and, I, and I, then I go to the power of provocative questions. This guest who saw you at the, is it the guest house that you were managing, cleaning, and, and, and saw the article on the wall and asked you, what are you doing if you can write like this? And then Mr. Fredolin Empe, is that the name? Yes, Fredolin Empe. Who said, why don't you pursue journalism? So two people among others asked you simple questions. What did those questions do to you? The first question didn't do much to me. Uh, it sounded like he even doubted I was the author of that article. So it came off as a doubt. One, the one that challenged me and uh, got me thinking was Mr. Empe's question. That why don't you go and pursue journalism? And at the time, I hadn't heard about the Ghana Institute of Journalism. And I'd even ruled out the possibility of doing a degree program after senior high school. The highest I thought I could go at the time was the uh, polytechnic because people were convincing my father to let us go to the teacher training college because he would rest uh, due to the availability of teacher training allowance. There was no money at home. That was the reality. Fortunately, that work I did after school helped me to get some money to be able to buy a form. But the possibility of doing journalism was extremely exciting because all along I felt I loved to write. And in one of the plays we wrote, I wrote, and then we went to act in Hohoi. It was, uh, there was a bit about radio news broadcast and I wrote the script bought a, a cassette and went for a headmaster's uh, tip and did a recording like a broadcaster. So that was the closest I had come to journalism. And in Ketekrachi, we had only GTV, GBC radio, which was transmitted through the Volta Star radio. We had no access to newspapers. Only 50 copies of the Daily Graphic came to the district. And they came 
a day later. So even today, if graphic is released, it gets to crash it tomorrow, late this evening, then the distribution will be done tomorrow. So only a few people had access to, if your father wasn't a, a head of department or a big person, you didn't have access. So the media was absolutely something I wasn't exposed to that much. So seeing that and uh, me knowing that writing was something I really liked, I felt so excited. So that question really stimulated me. I quickly called my elder brother and he said, why not? And that was when I made up my mind that it was going to be journalism and nothing else. Interestingly, the UCC, which, uh, should I say, denied me admission at the time, in one of their final year examination, the communications department, they used my work for the end of semester examination. So I don't think I've regretted. So you, you, you became, by extension, faculty or a reference point in a place that you didn't get the opportunity to go and learn as an undergrad. Yes, and I think I, it's, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. Me not getting admission to UCC, I wouldn't have been here today. And you talk about something that at the time must have hit you. Every, everyone when they get rejected by a school, a scholarship they apply for, an opportunity they don't get, they go for an interview and they don't get it. I, I, I had an experience like that. I, I recall going to apply mm -hmm. for a job in a particular bank and getting turned down. And, and years later, I was speaking at the same bank to their managers and I, 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 I reminded them and thanked the MD for not, not getting, taking me when they opened the bank. But at the time they say no to you, it's not nice. It wasn't. I felt so hurt. And one of the reasons was I was just tired of being in Ketekrachi. I attended primary. I attended junior high school there. Senior high school, I wanted to go to Tamale Senior High School, but because there was no money, I couldn't go. And it turned out later to be also one of the best moments of my life. Because if I had gone to Tamasco, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to write plays because it's quite a big school, well organized, they have uh, the resources. So they would have had their teachers and others doing those writings. So the inability to get to Tamasco got me to Krachi Senior High School and that helped me to really discover my writing. The inability to go to UCC uh, helped me to get into something that I think is the best moment of my life. But at the time, when I couldn't go to Tamasco, my father said, because there was no money, I should choose a school in Kitekrachi. I went into the room and worked. When I failed to get admission to UCC, and we're like friends, and some of my colleagues, I even did far better than in uh, Wasi. When they went to school uh, and came back, they went to university and came back, some of them started behaving as though they were from a different planet and it hurt so much but sometimes uh, you only look back to realize that god had written a very perfect script and hidden it from you and asked you to go and act so you are acting in a role you have no idea about and so as human as you are you feel very hurt let me pursue this idea of divine scripting. As, as a journalist, somebody would have called it destiny, somebody would have called it purpose, somebody would have called it divine guidance. But you say God has written a perfect script, just like how a journalist would see it. So this perfect script that you describe, would you say that when you look back at your life, all the dots are connected for your good? Extremely well connected. Help me to understand that. I came from a certain background. So one thing that has made me succeed as an investigative journalist is the disrespect for money or disrespect for ill-gotten wealth. As soon as I started my main investigative piece, that's a Judas scandal, I realized that people have so much money to throw out at whoever wants to expose them. But I was never moved or tempted one bit about whatever, is it a car, money, house, anything anybody ever suggested. It never moved me. Because I grew up uh, at a point or there was a point in my life when 
the next meal was a miracle. I grew up in very difficult times. And so when I got to a point that at least I could feed myself, I had a decent place to sleep. I got to realize that no, if I've gotten this far, then I can go as far as I have to be without getting compromised. So saying no to do the trappings of uh, ill-gotten wealth is something that has really helped me because I wouldn't have come this far. And I realized that that also was informed by the kind of uh, home or life or circumstances I grew up under. So the effect that uh, contentment was very key. Going to SHS, I never had the luxury of even taking Shito to school because it was so expensive. I did not miss the dining hall, but I was content with what I had. And there was a day I read a post by Matthew uh, of Springboard. He mentioned, he posted something about when he was in school and that uh, he was one of the neatest, were always almost judged, the neatest uh, boy in the school. And they had five uniforms and he always changed. After reading the post, it was the first time it uh, occurred to me that it was really possible or necessary to have more than one school uniform. Because we, we had only one school uniform and you could use it up to four or five years. That was the kind of life I grew up in. And so it was the first time I said that. But if I'm changing, I go to work every day and I wear a new shirt, then there was actually something wrong with wearing the same uniform five days in a week and uh, only getting to wash it on Saturdays. And at the time you were going through, it didn't even occur to you that you were No, no, no. It, it was, it was. And even after growing up, it was still normal until I read that post. So this is the kind of life I grew up in. So when I got to a certain stage that I could earn salary, I could uh, rent a decent place to live in, I could uh, even remit to others, I realized that no, it isn't worth soiling my reputation for something that I've not worked for. I believe there are two ways to make money, what you've worked for and what somebody has genuinely given to you without any negative strings attached. So that is, those are some of the dots that when I look back, it is as if God was preparing me for such okay. a time as this. Would, would that be the biggest value, the biggest principle of your life? I would say yes. Contentment. Not that I'm not ambitious. I would want to live in certain houses, in certain areas. I would want to be able to afford certain vacations. I would want to be able to drive certain cars. I would want to be able to eat from or at certain restaurants. I would want to be able to do certain kinds of charity, but I'm not there yet. So I should be satisfied with what I have today whilst dreaming for bigger and better things. And I always say that even if I do not progress beyond where I've gotten to now, I'll consider myself one of the most successful, richest people in this world. Not because of where I am, but because of where I have come from. So contentment, in my view, is very key. And one thing is certain, I'm very content as I spend quality time with my friend and my brother Manasseh Azuri Awuni and explore with him the foundational principles of his life. We've not even yet gotten into the deep end of his work. And that's what happens in the, in the engine room because much of what you know, you know about what is in the public space. I'm trying to get behind, behind the facade and find out what are the, the things that are in the engine room that have made him who he is. And he's so far been talking about journalism as a calling, an alternative career in the army, writing being his biggest passion, and potentially becoming a novelist in future and a part-time journalist. Number four has been about his beginnings as a playwright, a very interesting story about writing a play um, called uh, Land Litigation. Yes. 
and then he grew up wanting to become a bank manager, admiring the GCB manager for his opel, the white shirt and this and the suit and tie. Those are the values, the, the, the foundational images that influence his thinking. And then he spoke about provocative questions. So at the time he went to UCC to apply for BCom and got rejected. He says, while he was doing some ala ala job in a guest house, a guest who had come there and one Mr. Fridolin MP asked him a question about why not journalism because he was writing and pasting articles on the wall. And that was the doorway and eventually ended him up at, at GIG. But he mentions that one day his work was used as a resource for an examination at UCC. He talks about the divinely scripted life where every dot is connected. At the time of going through, it feels painful. But when you look back, you say God's hand was in this all along. And the last point before this was about contentment. He says he grew up with very little, but he grew up content. And so while he admires the nice things of life, he has absolutely no respect for ill-gotten wealth. That is Manasseh Azuri Awini. When I come back, let's explore GIG and then beyond. Please don't go away. In a world where you can be anything, who will you become? When you can go anywhere and never be alone, how far will you go? When your voice can reach every ear in the world, who will you inspire? When your money can travel faster and further, who will it reach? When you can tell a story in every language, which one will you tell? When you don't need permission to turn your dreams into reality, you go for it. Whatever it is, wherever it is, go. And when you think you've reached your limit, we'll keep you going. Let's go. There once was a man who had it all. He had skill. He had charisma. He was loved by all, but above all, he knew the importance of helping others, lifting others up. He knew the importance of giving other people an advantage so that they too would use that advantage to help others. All you need is that advantage that sets you apart from the rest. And when you discover that advantage, life's challenges don't seem so daunting anymore. That's where we come in. Enterprise, your advantage. UMB was established in 1972 as the premier bank for the corporate and private sector in Ghana. From our very beginning, as the only Ghanaian bank serving all categories of businesses, we set a standard for excellence and innovation over the past 45 years. We've built a financially healthy and strong bank, demonstrated our commitment to our customers and to growing businesses, and exhibited originality and innovation at every turn. At UMB, our focus is built around people, service, products and technology. These are the key to our present success and our future triumphs. At UMB, we are poised to make a difference not only with our customers, but also in the banking industry. We invite you to share in our future. Our future starts now with you. Welcome back to Springboard of Measure University, brought to you by the Springboard Roadshow Foundation and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, the enterprise group UMB Bank, with support from our friends at the multimedia group, where Manasseh was a star for several years, and the graphic communications group. Talking about graphic, on Tuesday in the graphic business, on page 18, read the full story of this conversation with Manasseh Azuri Awuni, the investigative journalist and editor-in-chief of the fourth estate who's my guest for today and one of the things that I, he has said that I, I think is the biggest shall i use the word revelation is that he does not enjoy what he does and many of you will be surprised because you assume that 
people who do well naturally enjoy what they do. But he says, while it is fulfilling to see the impact on individuals and the nation, it is too costly to his life, his comfort and his security. And for that reason, he sometimes wonders why he does it. But it must be a calling because he still will do this one and nothing else. That's a very big point, Manasseh. Very big point. It is true. And um, the people you are closest to, uh, people worry much about what you do. Because they love you. Yes. And I always say that when they say somebody is selfless, then they are very selfish towards the people who really care so much about them if you're going out or if you do this work there's a lot of dangers and your wife tells you that look i don't want to be a widow at this young age it is something you cannot forget about when you're out there if you're doing something your family call be careful and you listen to the tone beyond the words the worry in your voices and how you how much you know they value you and i come from a family that really really loves me so much i have my family as the biggest support system so if you know how these people value you and how head it will be when anything happens to you then you can't go out there and then forget about the words they speak to you but there must be something that uh, is stronger than all of this and so I believe it's a calling. A doctor wakes up and goes to work to save lives through the medical practice. An engineer goes to work to build roads to enable people to be safe as they travel. A pilot goes to work to fly a plane to transport people to their destination. A pastor mounts a pulpit to preach to bring people closer to God and to find their direction and space in life. A journalist writes to inform, educate, and entertain. Why is Manasseh Azuri Awuni constantly in danger? A journalist writes to inform, educate, and entertain. That is the basic form of journalism. Once you get into the field, you need to move beyond just writing to entertain, educate, and inform. A young man sent me uh, a WhatsApp message and he got a WhatsApp message from the cover of my book, Voice of Conscience, my, my number, sorry. And his message was that the, he had contemplated committing suicide, but he read an article in that book that I wrote about Komla Dumas' life and said something to the effect that if Komla Dumas did not give up, there's no reason for somebody to give up. And uh, he read that there was, at the time Komla Dumont passed, there was a student of uh, University of Education, Winneba, who committed suicide because he had failed and was withdrawn. So I brought that story in. And this young person had gone out to do medicine for a, for a very poor home. And he wants to get the licensure examination and be, be able to practice. And he said, anytime he goes to struggle, works, and then uh, gets money, he goes to do this examination, everything he pays to do the examination, then he fails and the interview, things don't work out. So he failed the first time, failed the second time, and went to work again to get some money. But at a point, he felt that it wasn't worth it. So he said he was planning to just use the money to enjoy and then after that commit suicide. And he read this. And this is not the first time somebody of that uh, somebody has written to me saying that for ABC reason, I am inspired to live on because of this thing I've read from you. Do you feel a greater sense of responsibility as a result of these responses that you get? Very. Very. That aside, apart from the very hard stuff I do, there are certain people whose lives have changed because of stories I've written about them. Two or so months ago, a young man, Tubaricola, came to me. He had completed a chassis and uh, has been 
taken to do his national service with one engineering firm. He's a, uh, an electrical engineer now. But I went to the Western, sorry, the Upper West region to do a, a, a training for the Media Foundation for West Africa. Then one assemblyman from Bihe community said, there's this boy in his community who has done so well, but how to go to school is a problem. So he believed that if I went and wrote about him, this guy would get some support. When I went where this guy was living and the uh, results he was able to obtain from Nandom Senior High School, made me believe this was a genius. So I did the story, and in one week, he had so much support, and there were as many as 12 institutions and individuals that were prepared to sponsor his education, from level 100 to 400. So he now had to choose. So he chose a $50,000 package from Ashes University. So he was housed free, feeding, snacks, stipend, laptop, everything at Ashesi for free. And he's completed. So beyond the hundreds of millions of CDs and sometimes dollars that my work as a journalist helps Ghana to save, there are a lot of individuals whose lives have changed significantly because of stories I've done about them. So I consider this work just more than entertainment, information, and education. In the Bible, God sent prophets to, uh, God uh, told the prophet that if, I, if you hear anything from me, warn my people. And what he said was that if you warn them and they do not change, and they die of their sins, you are free. But if you, I think it's somewhere in Ezekiel, if they die, Sorry, if, if they die of their sins because you fail to warn them, I would require their blood from your hands. So I see the work of journalists as uh, not being so much different from the work of prophets. It is all about the word warning. And there are times that you find people, even the politicians, there are certain top NDC people today who see me and they say, if you had listened to some of the things you were talking about, we wouldn't have been in opposition today. There were some who oh, are just a noise maker at this, but every day on my wall they come and say we lost the election because of people like you. Because they claim my writings made them unpopular and all of that. So, if you consider the work of a journalist carefully, there are lots of people in the media who are not journalists anyway, but because they have the microphones and other people assume they are journalists. But if you want to do journalism as it should be, it is something that should lead to the transformation of a country. It is something that should lead to the restoration of hope. It is a career that should let people rediscover themselves. It should be a career that should inspire people because only few jobs are able to reach millions of people they have never met or will never meet in their lives. And journalism is one of such a very important and powerful tools to use to transform our society. So I consider journalism more than just entertainment, education, and information. Every other person can do that. And that is Prophet Manasseh Azuri Awuni. Charlie, the name is nice, Prophet Manasseh. <laughs> Well, I, know the, the, I, know, I know a couple of them. I know, I know, I know a, very, yes. a very famous one. But yes, we, we, we met somewhere and I mentioned, hey, you got the one I've been looking forward to meeting you. And so, the name is quite unique. So when you yes, meet somebody, yeah, you, you, so you, 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 are you related you. to Prophet Achimanase yes. and all of that? Yeah, so. Right. Mm. Let's go to your time at GIG and a couple of things that happened. I mean, right, even right then, people yeah. thought there was something that you had. So let's explore that part of your life briefly and let's see. Yes. I went to GIJ with a lot of inferiority complex. Back in Ketekrachi Senior High School, if you heard about Infantipim School, Prempe, Achimota, and those top schools, they were like, uh, as I always say, from schools from different uh, planets. And there were some students who did not write uh, the mock examination, but when they saw mock papers from Prempe and other schools, they were struggling to answer because it was something else. So if you move from Karachi Secondary School, get to GIJ, and the, the degree program had just started. So both 
degree for diploma, so a degree for journalism and degree for public relations were 48 in the class. A very small class. So when the lecturers came, the introduction was to the effect that you mentioned your, your name and your school. And almost everybody got away with that. But when it got to my turn and I mentioned Krachi Senior High School, I had the additional question of having to tell the lecturer where Krachi Secondary School was. It was in the Bronx, I have original northern, and I always had to. And these were schools you respected so much. So if you met students from those schools, uh, the inferiority complex was there. And you go there in the morning, and some of them came in taxis, some were dropped off from very good vehicles, and uh, I had to walk from Tema Station to GIJ. So all of that made me think that, well, this, these people were not my class. Were you angry at the time? I was never angry. If there was anything, I was hungry to prove a point. So I remember very well a maid called Doris Bedu. Uh, she went to Holy Child School. And after some time, I said, are the people in the, your school, Crutchy Secondary School, are they all like you? Very intelligent. And some of the lecturers started praising some of the things I was doing. So if there was anything, I was never envious of them. I didn't regret where I was coming from. I was hungry to prove that I could be as good as them, uh, being in the same class with them. So at GIJ level 100, we didn't have the opportunity to do anything journalism. But I had the opportunity to do internship with GTV with the help of uh, Tim Kwashiga, who was a lecturer and had worked at GBC. And the first week, I went, I went out with somebody to do a story, and later on, the late Judith Briefo saw that the script I had written just to show to her it was so good that she used that one for the news. A week later, I was sent to go out and do stories on my own, contrary to what I had heard from my colleagues at GTV and GBC. If you go, they'll send you to buy roasted plantain and granite, and they won't give the young ones the opportunity. In my case, it wasn't uh, true. George Krenzel was the head of TV newsroom. After three weeks, called me and said, were you already a journalist before you came to GIJ? I said, no. I said, which school did you go then? I said, Kratje. Kratje Secondary School. And, Tell uh, you what, you, Asha, Asha, ask the guys here, Asha, Asha. But you, you really put Kate Kratje on the map with your story. Do you feel that Kate Kratje benefits a bit more than Bongo from your story? Yes. Krachi benefited more than Bongo from the work I Bongo have is done your hometown. My hometown. But you grew up in Kitekrachi. Kitekrachi. So for the benefit of those who may not know geographically, Bongo is in the upper, upper east, region. east region. Yes. Kitekrachi is in, is it Oti region? Oti region, Oti, yes. yes. The upper part from, of the Volta. Yes. Right. So the reason I even started bringing Bongo was there was this confusion among my readers. Your name sounds like somebody from the upper east region, but you are from Kitekrachi. What's the correlation? Yes. So the people uh, who read my works associated me more with Kete Crash, and they were always asking those questions. So I started uh, in my writings, I'll say the boy from Bongo, Albert Bongo's constituency. I remember. And so that was a deliberate thing to let people know that, okay, the confusion is uh, understood, but this is the fact. So GTV really helped me to realize that uh, the classroom journalism was a bit different from what was taught on the field. There was not much of practical. And back in GIJ, so I used to write, social media wasn't common when we started. And also, to get an article published in the graphic or times was a bit difficult. But I had a lot to write, even on campus issues. So I would write and then put them on the notice boards and then on the trees. That experience I had at the guest house. It brings me to, and, 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 and that brings me to the point I've been trying to carve out of uh, many of these conversations that we've had on, in the engine room, and that's the point about volunteerism. Some of the most defining things you've done were not things that you were paid for, and, or things that were demanded of you. You wrote, posted it on the guest house notice board. You wrote, yes. posted it on trees at, at GIG. Yes. Then they became the thing that pointed to your work. Do you think that volunteerism is a game changer in career development that is being overlooked by many? Yes, it is a game changer. It is some of the most uh, rewarding things you can do. It is the 
most profitable investment you can ever make in your life. How much I'm paid today does not depend on how much I work today or how well or how hard I work today. It depends and stems from the investment I made in those days for free. I became the journalist of the year when I was a freelancer. And freelancing in Ghana is free. You work virtually for free. As a freelancer, I was paid twice for my work. Graphic paid me 100 Ghana cities each for two front page stories. GTV, the stories I, 2010, 2011, 2012, I was the best TV news reporter for GJ Awards continuously for three years. And all this happened because I did internship with GTV News. And so by the time I completed, I could shoot my own uh, videos and won this award three years back to back. I couldn't have done that uh, if I hadn't got that opportunity. I have not applied for any of the jobs I've done since leaving school. All because even my national service, the Chiropractic and Wellness Centers, they looked at the, my writings and the HR manager at the time. Um, called me and said, I've been following your writing and I know you are completing. Would you want to do a national service with us? And at the time, national service were uh, personnel were paid around 200 cities a month, but they were paying me 560 cities. So those writings I was doing for free paid off. Those writings were what I published in my first book, I, a selection, Voice of Conscience. Those writings and works led me to win a number of awards. And the likes of Joy and others called me that we want to work with you. What are your terms? And we started negotiating. So if uh, the, every young person of today gets up and they have a talent, they have a calling, they think they are good at something, my advice is that Look at building a brand, look at making a name, look at paying your dues. And then you look back and realize that all that you did without much uh, reward was actually a very good investment that will reward you in a way that those monies could not have even compensated for. So I would say volunteerism is something that is very great. Everything aside, those are also moments of your life that uh, you don't often have to prove so much of a point. Uh, you are doing it for free. You are doing it at your leisure time. It gives you the opportunity to make some of the mistakes you would make before you get into the competitive world of work. So there's nothing more rewarding than doing some of these things. Talking about mistakes, I mean, you've... Many people talk about your awards, your big work you've done that has been celebrated across the world. But have you made mistakes in the course of your work? I do not, I do not think of uh, mistakes. I've had challenges. I have had challenges. The mistakes I've made, I don't think uh, there are any major mistake you can think about because... Do you have regrets? I would not say, I would say no, because for journalism, the kind of things you do, the mistakes you make are costly. People are going to take you on. And I have been sealed, uh, recently been sealed by Lighthouse, but before that one came, I had been sealed uh, eight times, six times for defamation and two other seals. The two others I won. But the six defamation seals that people think you've published is not true, I'm going to sue you. And these are big companies, RLG, Zoomline, and others. They have the money to hire the best lawyers to nail you. But they all run away from their cases. So uh, I am very confident that what I do uh, is good. I did one work that had a lot of controversy, the, those boys at the castle. Every single point of fact I raised I still stand by them, by them. I think the only thing that uh, the government and others took to NMC and made a whole lot of noise about was during the thriller, the online publication used a library picture of some people who were in, uh, uh, wearing some mask somewhere. That was the only like, the thriller to the main work. But if you view the main work, it is not in there but those publishing online used a library photo. 
So if you look at the other work, are these people uh, party affiliated? Yes. Do they have um, a history of that sort? Yes. They had even gone to Avian's Cargo Village to drive out people and the national security did an operation to sack them. And I had people from national security who confirmed this to me. I had the national security minister himself saying they had laid surveillance on them to track their activities and arrest them. I have their boss saying that national security has infiltrated our camps and they want to arrest us. So be careful. So all of these are facts that I do not regret ever putting out. And that's what I want, I want to explore. You, yes. You do heavy duty cases. I mean, heavy duty. That's the best way I can describe yes. them. You know, they are light cases. They are light issues and they are heavy duty issues. Yes. That take on huge institutions, huge establishments. And very often it comes with court cases, threats to your life. Do you fear? Yes, I fear. Oh, tell me about fear. I fear because I'm not suicidal. I fear because there are things I think I would want to live and then do. So if I should ever think, or people say Manas is fearless, I don't think uh, fearlessness is the right term to use. I think the right term may be courageous and being bold enough to overcome your fears. There should be something within you that's stronger than your fear. And that thing is uh, my hatred for injustice. When I was coming here, if there's a police officer at the flower pot, the underbridge, I think they are from the East Legon police, an MTD officer wearing white. I even have the picture here. If he remembers, he remember that somebody parked his car and came out to challenge him for stopping a driver. He, were, he was allowing a lot of people to get through, get an unapproved route. Then this driver also wanted to go. He said he's stopping the driver, but you're allowing everybody to go. And he was insistent. So I went out and said, I'm not against what you are doing. What you are doing is the right thing. But what made you wrong is you allowed so many people to, I was standing here watching you. So why do you have to single him out and say you should go back because he pointed it at you? So sometimes I find it uh, difficult to see somebody suffering injustice and just allow it to go. There you go. So this simple thing that I would watch it and express my disapproval in my mind or maybe to the person I'm driving with and then continue. You have taken a picture. You get down and go to challenge the person. Typically, what's next for Manasseh in a situation like what you just described? Typically, uh, some of these police, they can arrest you. Maybe it may not go anywhere, but they will waste your time the whole day. No, so in going to challenge somebody, you are not the one arrested. In going to challenge him and taking a picture, what would you typically do with that? Well, I'll put up a post and say, this policeman, what you did was wrong. I actually took the picture and it was still ongoing. And I felt the man was being cheated. He was being cheated. The police was doing the right thing, but he was applying the law selectively. So those who say, when I say Jai Monka, do you understand Chi? How many languages do you speak? I speak six. Grone, which they call Fra Fra, the Kachi language, the Guan. I speak Eve, I speak Chi, I speak Fante, and a little bit of English. Oh, look at you. <laughs> look at you. So those who say Jemonka, what would you tell them? Jemonka is what has uh, brought our nation this far. Far behind. And this Jemonka, when uh, you insist on your rights, it makes the nation better. It is something that uh, bullies are not prepared to stand. I once went to the Manpro, uh, no, no, uh, Dansuman Polyclinic and there was, uh, I need a police report for something. Then when I finished, the doctor said, this service, it was 50 cities. He said, this service, we don't give receipts. So I told him two things. You either give me the receipt or you give me back my money. And he gave me my money. I finished my master's. I was going to bind my... Uh, project work or dissertation at the binary of BAM library and the guy there charged me more than he should have charged and he wasn't prepared to give me a receipt. So I investigated him and he was punished. It was later on that some lecturers, when I published the story, 
said, well, they were also paying this unapproved fee because they didn't know. So when there are times that we can just allow things to go, but when we allow injustice to fester in the name of Jamonka, sometimes it may get so close to you. The soldiers who went on rampage to beat people in war, the public relations officer of the regional coordinating council they beat, and was on television with bruised faces, was my direct brother, my biological brother. So sometimes when we are fighting for these things, we are fighting for our children and uh, our families and the general uh, humanity at large. And for the big cases, I think uh, it can be terrifying. In a heated election, if you are going to release a story about a president who has gone to take uh, a vehicle, and before that story, you meet the president's friend who tells you that, look, we have done our calculation, and if this story comes out, we will not survive the next election. Then you know the stakes that are at stake. And then it should take some grace of God to push you to go forward, despite the potential fear. How do you spell Jaimonka? Manasseh, as you're I'm going to come to you to give you your closing thoughts. But for those of you who know me, in the engine room, you know we should give you our, our big learnings from this conversation. And this time has flown in great company. And I'm sure we'll do this again. Manasseh is always welcome here. He's, we've been to on the road show together to Tamale. He's spoken in various places. And there are so many things that we would have loved to explore in this conversation. But today, we'll wrap it up so you can chew on these lessons and then bring Manasseh again for another conversation that will be a blessing to you. But for the benefit of those who studiously write notes and have this debate that is ongoing on social media about the big lessons from the engine room, lesson number one is about a calling. He says he doesn't love what he does. He does it because he, he believes that it's a calling and even though there's cost to his life and comfort, something on the inside keeps pushing him. Number two, alternative career. He would have gone into the armed forces, but now thinking of it, Considering how he speaks his mind, he, may, he would have gotten into big trouble. Number three is about writing as his biggest dream or passion. Number four is about the inception of his career as a playwright, writing poetry and recitals at Katekrachi and writing about the land litigation, a play or a dance drama. The fifth was about early career aspirations, wanting to become a bank manager because of the visuals of the GCB manager with his opel white shirt, and then also with a suit and tie. Then sixth is about that picture letting him want to go to UCC to read BCom, the prestigious BCom, but not getting that opportunity. And then a couple of questions, provocative questions from guests at the, the lodge where he was managing and one Mr. Fridolin Empe provoking him to consider journalism and he ended up at GIJ. And the rest, as they say, is history. Number seven is about the divinely scripted life. A beautiful one about adversity being difficult to handle, but ultimately, you look back and everything is working together for your good. Number eight is about contentment, his greatest value. He says, the niceness of, of, of life, they are nice. Holidays, driving nice cars, all the things that we all like. But he's content with what he has and what he has worked for and does not respect ill-gotten wealth. Number nine is about responsibility and impact. He says, journalism definitely goes beyond informing, educating, and entertaining people. When your work helps somebody who wanted to commit suicide to rise up because you wrote about Kamala Dumont and his persistence, or somebody gets a full $50,000 scholarship at a chassis from first year to final year, definitely journalism is more than just information education and entertainment number 10 is about journalists as prophets prophet manasseh says just as the bible says the journalist is supposed to warn people about what the the future holds if things don't change and if you don't do that their blood will be required of you and that is a greater calling for journalists inspiring bringing hope and then lifting up society and the country as a whole number 11 is about volunteerism some of his best work greatest exposure Awards have come from work posted on walls, posted on trees, and done as freelance work for free. And the last one is about fear. He says, contrary to what you think, he is not fearless. 
and he's not suicidal. He fears for his life in the course of his work. But something great on the inside keeps pushing him. And I said, this has been beautiful. 12 wonderful lessons to take home from this conversation. Which is your favorite? My favorite, I'll say the contentment. Contentment. It's a yes. beautiful one. The Bible says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Do you fear God? Yes, I do. I do. It's something that really has brought me this far, the God factor. Because sometimes I look back and I cannot, I see some gaps that I feel have only been filled by God. I rebelled. My father is not a Christian, so I rebelled that I wasn't going to do any other thing and I would serve God. At the time it was difficult, but he accepted it eventually and all my siblings got converted and we are all Christians. So godliness for me is very key. Without God, when I go back to Christ and I look at some of the people we grew up with, some even came from better homes than us. And I have God friends that we meet here in Accra at programs and people who tell you they are proud of you today. And in those days, it was a great honor to even be said to be friends to those, of those, to those people. So I see the God factor very strongly in my life. What's your favorite hymn? My favorite hymn is Presbyterian hymn 468. Christo Mojani Netrene. So in my Presby hymn book, I think I wrote this in 2008, when I bought the hymn book, I circled and said, it's my burial hymn. Really? You, yes. You chose your burial hymn already? Yes. Explain the, the words you just said in English. Uh, the, I think the, the blood of Jesus and his righteousness is uh, my clothing. And when God calls me, that's what I'll wear to him. Loosely translated, yes. And that's Presby him. 468. On the 468th hymn, we end this wonderful conversation with Manasseh Azuri Awuni, freelance journalist and editor-in-chief of the Fourth Estate. Let's continue the conversation on social media. Which of the 12 points is your favorite? So we come your way again next week in the engine room. My name is Albert Okran. On behalf of the Springboard Roadshow Foundation, our sponsors, the multimedia, our sponsors. My name is Albert Okran. On behalf of the Springboard Roadshow Foundation and our sponsors, MTN Pulse, the Enterprise Group, UMB Bank, and our media partners, the multimedia group and the graphic communications group saying, God bless you. God bless you and God bless you. We are out. <laughs>